So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, so thank you to those of you who submitted questions prior to the webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we will be covering most of those questions this evening. And we do want to keep the presentation to one hour. So if we don't get to your question today, you're welcome to email myself or SSCA after the webinar. And uh, we do have a slide at the end of the presentation that includes our contact information. Since this is a webinar, you'll be able to see and hear us. Um, but uh, and you'll be able to see who's speaking, but we won't be able to see or hear you. If you would like to ask a question, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button. And if you click on that, you'll be able to type in your question and I'll be monitoring the Q&A submissions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time to address these questions if we didn't cover them in the presentation. And uh, just so you're aware, this evening we also have some polling questions for registrants. So these are optional multiple choice questions um, that will pop up on the screen and your responses are completely anonymous. When we launch a poll, it will um, give you a couple seconds to participate if you're interested. And on the next slide, you'll see the agenda for the webinar. And uh, this evening, what we're covering is non-bias technical information about gypsy moths. So the speakers will discuss things like the history of gypsy moths in the area, their life cycle, uh, um, what you can expect in the years to come with this invasive forest pest, but what we won't be providing is any personal or professional management recommendations. Instead, we'll provide an overview of all the management options that you have available to you as a property owner. And uh, we'll also provide some tips and tricks and important reminders uh, to consider for each control option available. And of course, this would not be at all possible without our wonderful guest speakers today. And that's Tamara Brincat and Paul Bell. So thank you so much to, for, uh, to both of you for being here tonight. And with that, I will pass things over to Tamara. Thanks so much, Maggie. So um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight to learn a little bit about Gypsy Moth. Um, I'm Tamara Brinkat. I'm the Invasive Species Program Coordinator with Severn Sound Environmental Association. Just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I um, majored in biology at the University of Guelph and um, I did my graduate studies at um, Niagara College in Ecosystem Restoration. I'm going to be speaking on some of the technical information on gypsy moth tonight. And I'm also uh, going to introduce Paul here. So I'll pass it over to Paul. Thank you, Tamara. I'm Paul Bell. I'm a forest entomologist. And I had the good fortune to work on gypsy moth for the previous three large infestations. I worked with BT. I worked with other materials to try and control this particular insect pest, working for Ministry of Natural Resources, federal government, and a variety of private companies. So hopefully I can help out with any questions related to gypsy moth and how to control them. Great, thanks, Paul. So um, before we dive into gypsy moth, I'm gonna give you a bit of a background of who the Severn Sound Environmental Association is. Um, I'll also refer to them as SSEA for short. Um, so many of you have, um, have already heard of SSEA before. And for some of you, this may be the first time that you're hearing about us. Um, so just to provide you some context, SSEA is a joint municipal service board. Um, so we provide environmental services to eight municipalities, the ones that are listed on the presentation there. And the SSEA um, covers uh, the Severn Sound watershed. So it's outlined in red on the slide here. Um, it's an area of approximately 1,000 square kilometers, and it's a group of bays in southeastern Georgian Bay. It includes open water of Severn Sound and all the way from Machadash Bay in the east to Penetanguishene Bay in the west. Uh, the Severn Sound area covers as far north as uh, Honey Harbor and Beausoleil Island. It also includes the land base and river systems that drain into Severn Sound. Um, so some of the services that uh, SSEA provides to our municipalities are listed here. Um, there's a wide range of services and I'm not gonna go into detail today, but we uh, cover everything from environmental monitoring to climate change plans. Um, and we also have an invasive species program, which is the reason that we're here today.
The goal of the invasive species program is to reduce the ecological, economic and social impact of invasive species in the Severn Sound watershed. Um, this is accomplished through prevention, monitoring, management and education and a list of um, some of our services and responsibilities are listed there. So to provide you uh, with an introduction to invasive species, because you might be asking what is an invasive species, um, I've included a diagram here. And um, before I talk a little bit about invasive species, I'm just going to ask Maggie to launch a poll. So she's um, launching a poll that just asks, um, what invasive species are you concerned about? Um, so to give you some context, invasive species are any organisms that have been introduced outside of their um, natural or past distribution, and they threaten the economy, society, uh, ecosystems, or human health in some sort of way. Some of the common invasive species that we see in um, Tiny and the surrounding areas include emerald, emerald ash borer, which is a beetle that affects ash trees, invasive Phragmites, which is an aggressive wetland plant, zebra mussels, which you may already be familiar with, and of course, the star of tonight, which is gypsy moth. So I think we'll give a few more seconds for people to answer our first question on the poll here. And then Maggie, if you could share the results. Awesome. So we have a lot for Emerald Ash Borer, a lot for Phragmites, and then we have some of the other ones as well. And um, if we didn't cover an invasive species on this list that you're interested in learning more about, you can just um, put it in the question and answer or chat with us, um, or you can follow up later. Um, so, again, before we dive into gypsy moth, we just want to get um, gauge people's uh, knowledge on gypsy moth. So we're going to ask you to do another poll. So this one is asking which caterpillar is a gypsy moth caterpillar. So is that A, B or C? So again, Maggie, if you don't mind launching a poll. And we'll give about 30 seconds for people to get their answers in. And then Paul can talk about um, which caterpillar is a gypsy moth in a few minutes. So we'll keep that poll open for another 30 seconds and, and we're gonna move on. So I'm gonna pass it over to Paul because he is going to introduce gypsy moth and talk about some of the impacts. And then later on, I can talk about the life cycle and management. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, great slide there. That's a, a picture of a female gypsy moth with her egg mass. I'm sure you've seen lots of them this past summer and a little bit the year before that. That'd be about a thousand eggs waiting to hatch there. So a tree that you see several hundred egg masses on, like in this picture, would have hundreds of thousands of eggs, if not millions of eggs on just one tree. It's an invasive insect. It was brought to us by an entomologist, uh, an entomologist uh, living in uh, Maine in the United States thought, oh, I might be able to make silk cheap. So I'll try this insect that produces a silky strand of uh, material and maybe I can get rich. Well, a windstorm came and the rest is history. The cages fell over and now we have infestations all over North America. And in Ontario alone, we've had three fairly large ones four if you count the one we're currently in. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, what that's about is they tend to be in charge of any, uh, looking out for any invasive species, particularly insects. For instance, you may have heard of uh, the Asian longhorn borer. It came in through crates from China, wood crates that had the insect in it. So they're constantly trying to find these new insects. But of course, like COVID virus, other things like that, it does get into the country and then they're required to manage it. Um, the impacts you can see virtually anywhere in tiny township or indeed the entire area, uh, the trees become quite defoliated. And also if you notice last year around 
late June or so, it looked very much like spring. Most of the leaves were missing from trees like oak, white pine, species that they prefer. They, they can feed on hundreds of different species. Then later in the season, the leaves seem to come back and a lot of the trees will re uh, flush their leaves and are able to survive that way. I alone have a number of trees on, on my small piece of property that oak trees that are 100, 120 years old, they've been through several infestations and they're fine. They do get weakened if the infestations last quite a number of years, but they do survive. And I think that's what will happen to most of this area. A lot of the pine trees though, if they get repeatedly defoliated, they can get into some severe stress. Um, maybe we could look at those caterpillars and see which one is the gypsy moth. Do we have the results of the poll? Excellent. Yes, indeed. Uh, C sometimes is confused with gypsy moth because it's hairy, but that in fact is the fall webworm. And uh, that's the one you see in the fall of the year with lots of webbing, usually on the side of the road. If you see webbing in the spring, it's the Eastern tent caterpillar. And the other caterpillar there is actually the forest tent caterpillar, which doesn't produce a tent, but it is a, a partially hairy caterpillar. And we'll be seeing a lot of those in about two or three years because the next infestation of the forest tent caterpillar, I'm afraid to say on our maples and aspens will be here. Over to Thanks, you, Paul. Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the gypsy moth life cycle now. Um, so a really important characteristic of gypsy moth in Ontario is that their populations go through cycles of ups and downs. Um, so this graph here, which is um, from the Ministry of Natural uh, Resources and Forestry, shows um, moderate to severe defoliation in Ontario. So on the left of the graph, uh, it's 1980, and then on all the way to the right is 2018. So um, anywhere that you see those peaks, that's where um, we experienced a lot of defoliation. And then on those lower parts, that's um, not a lot of defoliation. So that just coincides with the gypsy moth um, population. Um, so their population surges about every seven to 10 years. Um, it will rise rapidly and then it follows um, a natural crash. And the outbreaks are typically um, collapsed by natural factors, including competition with other caterpillars, predators, pathogens, and weather. Um, in Ontario, gypsy moth is actually beyond the stage where it can be eradicated. So as a result, we're expected to experience these periodic population increases. Um, we've previously seen four outbreaks, including in 1984, 1991, 2002, and 2008. Um, not included on the graph here is the one that there we're currently in. So that one began around 2019. And um, it's, uh, it's expected that it's going to last another few, uh, sorry, it's going to last a few years, and then the population will collapse, just like the historical trend. Um, so knowing and identifying the different stages of gypsy moth are very important to knowing how to manage its spread and being aware of what control methods are effective and what time those methods are affected. So gypsy moth goes through four stages, including its egg or egg mass stage, its larval or caterpillar stage, its pupil or cocoon stage, and then the adult stage. Um, the graphic on the slide there uh, shows you what the rough uh, estimates of time that the um, or that the gypsy moth is in its various stages. Um, some of the factors that affect when these exact stages occur depend on climate, uh, location, and population stressors. And you also may notice that there may be some overlapping life stages. So, for example, um, you will see some caterpillars enter their cocoons before others. So as a result, you'll see caterpillars and cocoons at the same time. It's important to note that gypsy moth only feeds during its caterpillar stage. So this is when we notice the most uh, significant impacts of gypsy moth. Um, 
Um, so the first stage of gypsy moth is their egg stage. And this is uh, where the gypsy moths are currently at in their life cycle. So you'll notice um, these egg masses on your trees now. The female moths will lay their eggs in late summer, typically uh, around August, and then they will overwinter in these egg masses and then hatch around um, early spring, so April to May. And this again depends on climate conditions. Um, the oval egg masses are identified by um, their tan colored hairs and they're usually three to six centimeters in length. When they're freshly laid, they look like an orange or golden color that you see on the left there. And then um, after they overwinter or older egg masses will have a typically pale or bleached appearance. Um, egg masses can carry anywhere from 100 to 1000 eggs depending on the size. So if you see an egg mass that's the size of a toonie, it's typically carrying up to 1000 eggs. And then if you see um, an egg mass that is more the size of a dime, it's probably on that lower end of the um, scale and it probably has only 100 eggs. Those size of the egg masses can be a pretty good indicator um, if, as if the population's decreasing. So um, those smaller ones might be able to tell us when uh, the outbreak is, is nearing its collapse. Um, one thing I want to point out is that gypsy moths will lay eggs on pretty much any surface outdoors. Um, so you'll notice in the picture here, I have a uh, gypsy moth on a um, car headlight, and then there's also gypsy moth on a shed overhang. We've seen gypsy moths on um, outdoor furniture, buildings, vehicles, decks, fences, pretty much any surface that you can find outside. They can also hitch a ride to new areas and um, spread this way. Um, so the next stage is caterpillars. So um, as I said, caterpillars typically hatch around April to May, um, and then they're in their caterpillar stage from around this time to mid July. Um, this is when they're actively feeding. So um, they're feeding on the leaves of trees and shrubs and one caterpillar can eat up to one square meter of leaves. Um, when they hatch, they will look like tiny little black ants and then they'll grow and molt several times until up, up to about six centimeters. The mature caterpillars are light gray um, to black in color and then they have um, hairs on them, which are actually very irritating um, because they contain histamine, so they can cause allergic reactions in people. Um, the mature caterpillars also have five pairs of blue dots uh, and six pairs of red dots. The smaller caterpillars um, will produce a thread that actually allows them to be carried by wind currents, so um, they essentially can fly up to one kilometer when they're that size. Um, this is again another way that they can spread to new areas, so it's an important consideration for management. After um, their caterpillar stage, um, they'll you move to a sheltered location to begin transforming into a moth. Um, so this is around July, and they'll be in this stage um, from July to August. You can identify the um, cocoons um, by their dark brown shell, which is segmented. And it also has those um, orange irritators. And at this point, they're no longer feeding on end trees. Um, so they will typically emerge from um, their cocoons as adults um, around July to September. So the males and females look slightly different. Um, the male is on the left hand side there and they're brown with feathery antenna. And then the white or the females are typically whitish and they're heavy so they don't fly. Um, females will send out pheromones to attract a male. And um, at this point, their sole purpose is to mate and lay eggs. So again, they're no longer feeding because they don't have any mouth parts. The females are um, capable of laying more than one egg mass, but they typically only lay one. And the male moth can actually mate with multiple females. Um, so that was a general overview of the life cycle. 
Um, so we're going to go into some of the management considerations. So I'm just going to ask Maggie to launch another poll again. Um, so we have a poll here, and I just want to remind you that it is anonymous. So we're we're uh, not looking to know specific people management, but we're just interested to know um, what everyone's objective is in managing gypsy moth. Um, so some of the objectives that we've provided here are aesthetics. So maybe um, you don't like the look of gypsy moth or egg mass on your property, or you don't like the look of defoliated trees. Um, maybe it's recreation. Maybe you're having a hard time using your property while the gypsy moth caterpillars are out because of um, things like their frass or their irritating uh, hairs. Um, maybe it's wood supply or syrup production. Maybe you're looking at habitat, um, maybe it's human health, or maybe you have a specific high risk or high value tree that you're trying to protect. Um, we want to emphasize that um, managing gypsy moth populations is bringing um, the populations to tolerable levels and reducing defoliation, and it's um, not intending to drive next year's population. So um, it's about keeping trees alive until natural controls can cause a population to uh, collapse. Um, another thing to consider for management is that uh, timing is critical. So um, we're gonna provide some management options um, that property owners can take and timing of those management options is important um, because different life stages uh, will be affected differently. Awesome, so uh, that's great results. So we have 97% um, of people said tree protection. So that's great. And all of those other reasons are, are important as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to Paul again, who's gonna talk about some of the natural controls of gypsy moth before I talk about some of the management options that property owners can take. Thank you, uh, Tamara. Um, as uh, Tamara mentioned, the, the population will crash. And one of the main reasons it will crash on its own are on the screen in front of you right now. NPV stands for nuclear polyhydrosis virus. So it's a type of disease that seems to attack just the gypsy moth. There are other NPVs that attack other insects, but this particular one attacks gypsy moth. And if you're curious which ones died from NPV, they form that inverse V shape on the side of the tree and die right there and maintain that pose for the, the rest of the season. Leave them there if you can, because they're quite infectious. They're full of virus particles and any caterpillar that comes near that, they're not too keen on social distancing. They'll pick up that virus and spread it to others. So it's a good thing. And I noticed last summer anecdotally, that there is quite a bit of NPV in our region. The other caterpillar there that's laying lengthways uh, is affected by a fungus. And there's a lot of that fungus going around as well, killing lots of them naturally. Uh, this is a good spring for that type of fungus because it likes cool, damp springs in order to produce a lot of spores, which again can be spread through the population by them getting too close to one another or just being the spores being blown in the air. Uh, a third one not visible there is Bt itself. Uh, Bt is used as a control agent. Bt exists in the soil and uh, insects like the gypsy moth can become exposed to it and succumb to that. So there's bacteria, there's fungus, and there's virus affecting them. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, another natural control is the weather itself that Tamara mentioned. And if we have a really cold couple of nights like we did in February, where it got below minus 20 degrees centigrade for about three nights in a row, it would kill off uh, quite a few of the gypsy moth egg masses. That red line is to represent the snow level. Um, this photograph was taken just a couple of weeks ago in a Wenda Park. And you can see that below that red line, the uh, egg masses are typical, they're brown, they look healthy, and indeed the, the warm cover of snow helped them overwinter fairly well. So most of those will likely hatch. The ones above the red line are whiter because they've been bleached in the sun, and they may have been 
severely compromised by the cold weather. And as a result, the mortality rate is very high in mosaic masses. So if you're at home trying to control them yourself, you've heard of ways of scraping or you've come to some of our outdoor demonstrations of scraping off egg masses, putting them in soapy water to kill them. Concentrate on specimens that are below that red line. And you still have over a month to uh, work on those egg masses to control uh, the insects on your property. And if I could have the next slide, please. Or other natural controls. Yes, uh, there's a number of predators and parasites, uh, certainly ants, spiders. There's uh, at least 14 different kinds of beetles that feed on these. Number of birds, uh, maybe you haven't heard of the black-billed cuckoo, but you will in next year because their population will go up slightly because of all the food they have. A uh, number of warblers feed on them. Most birds don't really like the gypsy moth because of those irritating hairs, but still a number of birds do depend on them. It's a good food resource for them. Squirrels, chipmunks, there's quite a few things that feed on them and use it as bounty uh, to have more baby chipmunks, more baby warblers, et cetera. So that's it for natural controls. There are of course others, but those are the main ones. Awesome, thank you, Paul. So I'm gonna talk about some of the management options for property owners. Um, so for um, from August to April, you can do egg mass scraping. Um, so this is something that you can actually be doing currently. Um, so you basically just need uh, gloves, a scraping tool and soapy water. And then I have a video to demonstrate here how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. And my internet is probably not the greatest. So if it does seem a little bit choppy, the video is available online. Um, so what you would do is you'd scrape the egg masses into soapy water and then leave those egg mass soapy water mixture for 48 or more hours. And then you dump um, that mixture away from any water sources on your property. Um, when you're choosing to scrape egg masses, just make sure to check uh, outdoor furniture and buildings and some of those other surfaces that I talked about before, um, because it's not only trees that have egg masses. Um, so another management option is um, insecticide. So this one has to be done during the caterpillar stage um, when they're actively feeding. So around May to June. Um, it's really up to landowners to decide whether or not they have insecticides applied on their properties. So by landowners, I mean individual property owners or municipalities, um, County of Simcoe, who owns forests or provincial parks, um, depending who owns the land. There are two insecticides that are approved in Canada for the use against gypsy moth, one of them being triazine tree injections, and then the other BTK, or Bacillus thuringiensis cristaki, which is a spray. Um, starting with triazine, uh, those are injections for individual trees and those provide um, protection for one season or one year of gypsy moth. And that's usually used on higher risk or higher value trees. Um, triazine must be purchased and applied by a registered pe pesticide applicator. Um, and on a side note here, it's also used to control the invasive species emerald ash borer. The other option here is BTK. Um, so this one can be applied uh, by the ground or by aerial application, and it's applied to uh, affected tree leaves. Um, ground application can be purchased and applied by a property owner or a contractor, um, as long as they're following uh, label directions and precautions. And then um, aerial application must be done by a registered pesticide applicator. Um, if either of these insecticides are used, uh, it's appropriate timing of treatment is essential for successful control. Um, they're, they're time and sensi uh, weather sensitive and it allows for a very narrow treatment window. So it must be applied um, during the caterpillars early or immature stage when they're actively feeding on leaves. And as I said before, this is typically uh, late May, early June, but it can vary depending on um, population and weather conditions. 
Um, the caterpillars will have to ingest the insecticide for it to work for specifically for BTK. Um, it's not a contact insecticide. So if it's applied um, during those other stages, it will be ineffective. Um, and another thing to note is both of these insecticides um, are not specific to gypsy moth and they can kill um, other native caterpillar species that are beneficial and that are feeding on the um, plants the same time that BTK is sprayed. Um, there are also um, federal, provincial, and municipal permits and permissions that apply depending on um, the proposed treatment and the location of treatment. Um, there's always an option to talk with a, for a forestry professional or tree professional um, if you wish to manage the health of privately owned trees or woodlots. And if you do intend to hire a contractor, um, just advising you to uh, interview them and ask for references and make sure that they know all of the legal requirements. Um, you just want to make sure that um, they're aware of some of the other non-target species that could be affected um, at the time of application and that they know all the legal requirements. Um, the next management option we have here is um, referred to as shade trapping. Um, so this is done during the caterpillar or moth stage. So from June to September, um, and it is essentially wrapping burlap or a white sheet um, or any material really around your tree and then tying it with rope or twine um, and then creating an overhang. Um, so caterpillars will come down the tree on hot days looking for shade and they'll um, get stuck in that trap there. And then um, you can come along and collect and scrape the caterpillars again into soapy water for 48 or more hours. Um, I would advise that you check the trap daily because as you may have experienced in previous years, um, the population of gypsy moth is quite high after hatching, so that trap will fill up fairly quickly. Another point um, is that moths can also get stuck in these shade traps and um, they can lay their eggs there, so just check for um, actual moths and egg masses as well. Um, and then the last management option we're going to talk about today is hand picking. So this can be done for caterpillars, um, pupa and moths. And um, it's so basically it can be done um, from April to September. And again, placing those into soapy water for 48 hours. Um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier is that um, you don't really want to handle gypsy moths directly. It's it's advised that you wear gloves just because of those irritating hairs. Um, they could cause a reaction on your skin. Um, so some of the other management options that you may have heard of that we didn't talk about today are pheromone traps. Um, so essentially pheromone traps uh, will release the pheromone and attract the male gypsy moth. Um, the reason we didn't list them here today is because they're not approved for management in Canada. They're only approved for gypsy moth detection. And then um, another management um, option that you may have heard of is sticky traps. So um, that is essentially sticking um, either tape or glue around the base of the tree and um, the caterpillars will crawl and get stuck on that. Um, the reason we have not mentioned it here today is just because of the concern for non-target species. So we've heard a lot of anecdotal reports of wildlife such as birds or mice getting stuck in these traps and other non-target uh, beneficial insects. Um, so we, we just didn't want to talk about it today for that reason. Um, I think Maggie may have another poll coming up. Um, so this one is just to ask uh, if you're intending to um, use any management options for 2021. So we've indicated a number here. And then if you have um, another management option that you're thinking of, you can indicate that in um, maybe the question and answer um, box. Um, so while you're completing that poll, I'm just going to move on here. Um, so there are a number of resources available online to help you decide on um, and prepare for management techniques and to help you properly time them. Um, SSEA has some resources such as uh, a fact sheet and videos as well as our social media. Uh, where we provide information on gypsy moth, um, information on the outbreak and information on life cycle status. There are also other um, 
predictive models that are available online, um, such as the bioforest um, hatch dates and the MNRF forest health conditions, which I'm going to go over in a second. And then um, there is also um, the SSEA citizen science program, which again, I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, so the first predictive model um, would be uh, from Bioforest. So this one um, estimates caterpillar hatch dates based on environment um, Canada climate data. Um, so this was from 2020 and um, this shows when we experienced 10% of caterpillar hatching. Um, so you'll notice for um, the tiny and surrounding areas that um, the model shows we're a light to dark green, which indicates that we're going to experience 10% of gypsy moth uh, hatching around May 23rd to May 28th. And again, these are just predictions. These are not the actual results of what happened last year. Um, and then here is the 90% gypsy moth hatch date. Um, so our area is a light to dark blue, which indicates it was predicted we'll experience 90% uh, of gypsy moth hatching around June 4th to June 9th. And again, these models can be used to estimate um, when gypsy moths are going to hatch this year and then help you time management properly. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry also has an annual forest health monitoring program. So through this program, they record and monitor major factors affecting forest health conditions, including um, insects and disease. For 2020, um, one of the specific species that they monitored was gypsy moth. Um, they did so by completing aerial defoliation surveys and on the ground egg mass surveys. Um, the specific results are published online, but I've included their map here. Um, so you're probably already aware of the fact that we experienced uh, moderate to severe defoliation last year. And um, the map here confirms that. Um, so with the data that they found in 2020, they, will, they were able to make some predictions for 2021. Um, so they anticipated that our, our area is likely to experience moderate to severe defoliation again this year. Um, however, what this model doesn't take into consideration is some of those natural factors that have been ultimately um, the cause of collapsing outbreaks. So um, any overwinter mortality, um, climate, any pathogens or parasites, um, that information is not included here. And we won't see the effects of those factors until gypsy moths hatch. Um, in that MNRF report or Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry report, uh, they did point out that although the gypsy moth is still considered an invasive species that federal legislation regulates, it has evolved to a state of naturalization. So this means that gypsy moth population may have periodic predictable outbreaks, which is what we saw in 2020. Um, all of the information and um, maps are, that I've showed on the last two slides, those are all available online. So if you're interested in learning more about their monitoring program or some of those predictions, um, I would encourage you to visit the link there. And as Maggie said, uh, the presentation will be available after. Um, so you will be able to find these sources. Um, so the last thing uh, that I want to point out is that um, SSEA had a, has a citizen science program. So this is a program um, where we ask volunteers to monitor um, gypsy moth on their own property. Um, you can do, the, do that uh, with SSEA instructions and then um, you can report gypsy moth information to SSEA and we're looking specifically for um, gypsy moth hatch date some of those natural controls that you may observe and some of the management that you may have taken on your property. If this is something that you think you're interested in, you can email me at invasive species at Severn Sound and I can um, provide you with more information. Um, so I'm gonna summarize um, some of the key messages today um, and hopefully this is what you took away from the presentation. Uh, so first of all, gypsy moth is an invasive species that follows a relatively predictable life cycle in Ontario and it's beyond the point of eradication. Um, other invasive species also have economic, environmental and social impacts. So the issues that we're dealing with with gypsy moth highlight the need for us to focus on prevention and early management of these species. 
Um, there are many factors that play a role in predicting population. Um, so some of those include uh, weather, um, pathogens, predators, and some of the other natural controls that uh, Paul talked about. Some of those natural controls um, have ultimately collapsed outbreaks historically, and it's expected to do so um, in future years. Management is really up to specific property owners, and the goal of management is to reduce defoliation of trees and necessarily to drive population uh, for next year. The management timing is critical, and um, it's different for each life stage, um, so it's important that you make observations. And then lastly, you can provide observations to SSCA um, and uh, report that information. And then we will be providing um, updates on outbreaks and life cycles on our social media. So I'm going to pass it back over to Maggie and she is going to um, control the question period. Awesome, thank you, Tamara. So, we do have some time left over to answer uh, some questions we've been receiving tonight. Uh, thanks everyone who's been submitting those really excellent questions. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to um, have a big virtual round of applause for our wonderful speakers this evening, Paul and Tamara. Again, this wouldn't be possible without, without you. So thank you so much for sharing um, all of that wonderful information. Um, I would also like to thank my colleague Jalen Josiah for all his help and technical expertise in setting up this webinar. It would not have been possible without him um, as well. And thank you to all of you here tonight who took the time to learn about uh, this invasive species. So uh, before we do get into the Q&A, and there's a lot of really great um, questions, so please stick around to hear those, um, I would like to launch one last quick poll, and, um, and that's just so we can learn a little bit more about how you um, heard about the webinar tonight. So I've launched that. So just let me know um, where you learned about the webinar and um, it's good information for us to have. And basically with the question and answer period, I'll, um, I'll just be announcing some of the questions that we've been receiving. And I'll ask uh, Tamara or Paul to just briefly answer the questions that are coming in. And that's just so we can get through as many of them as, as, many of them as possible. And um, I might even get Tamara to share that last slide one more time. And that last slide, um, it has our contact information on it. So it says environment at tiny.ca. Um, that's to contact the township of Tiny. And you can also contact SSCA. And uh, basically, if we weren't able to get to your question tonight, please feel free to submit any questions to those emails and um, we're happy uh, to get the information that you need. So again, that's uh, environment at tiny.ca um, to contact the, the municipality. And then at the bottom, you see invasive species at severnsound.ca. So, um, you know, write those down or um, shoot us an email and uh, we'll get back to you if your answer, if your question is not answered uh, tonight. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll jump right into the questions because we've received um, quite a few. And I might uh, pass this one over to Paul first. Um, this question says, if I use dormant oil spray just for tree cavities where I cannot manually remove egg masses, will that negatively impact insects and wildlife such as cicadas? Um, well, dormant oil is usually used for scale insects and aphids. So that's what it's best used for. That's what it's licensed for. Um, if you're trying to get them into cavities, that I would think soapy water would probably be a little bit better. And cicadas at uh, that time of the year when you would be controlling would probably still be underground because they spend most of their life in the ground feeding on tree roots and then crawl up quickly later in the summer where you can hear them producing those loud sounds. So you're okay to use dormant oil, but I would recommend soapy water. And maybe as a follow-up to that, a second question um, was asking about, um, you know, is, is there any other spray that someone can use rather than scraping or is scraping the recommended um, like method if, if you're gonna be removing individual egg masses? Scraping's probably the best. The problem is all that fur that the female moth leaves behind. It's an insulation factor and it also tends to repel any moisture. Soap, though, is a good universal insecticide. It's not going to affect your well. It's not going to affect uh, your pets, your kids. So soap is a good one to use. And, uh, you know, I'm not a sponsor for Dawn, but 
Dawn soap in a little bit of warm water in a spray bottle uh, that you'd use normally for dishes works quite effectively against a wide variety of insects. They don't like it. It breaks down their outer uh, protective layer and they basically uh, dry out. Great, thank you. Um, Tamara, I might send this next question to you. Um, this person's asking, what would you classify as a high risk or high value tree? Um, I think that's really a, a subjective opinion. Uh, it depends on what you consider high risk or high value. So um, to one person, there may be a special oak that they have on their property that's 100 years old and they're concerned about it. So that might be a high value tree. Um, to another person, it might be a tree that is already stressed with maybe another insect or disease. Um, so they're concerned about the health of the tree. Um, typically, uh, healthy deciduous trees will survive several years of uh, heavy defoliation. Um, however, uh, conifers are more susceptible um, to uh, death after 100% defoliation. And I think Paul touched on that earlier. But yeah, so it really depends on, on what you consider high value. And that's going to be different to everyone and every individual property. Yeah. Uh, as a follow-up, is there anything that uh, homeowners can do to boost the strength of trees when they are um, when they've lost their leaves? Um, so, if if we're experiencing drier conditions, they they could water their trees. Um, it's it's harder when you have a large woodlot. You can't go to each individual tree and water it. So, um, just using some of those management techniques that we talked about. Um, for the gypsy moth, some of those ones that we talked about uh, property owners can take. Um, and if, uh, if there is another insect or um, disease that a tree has, looking into other management options for those. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, I'll uh, send this next question your way. Is BTK harmful to human health? No, not at all. Um, it's designed to control a particular type of insect and its stomach is completely different from ours. You could ingest BTK, I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, <laughs> it, it would have no, no real effect on you at all. Um, you should check the label though, and just, just check to see what kind of adjuvants have been added to the spray, what type of wetting agents, what type of sticking agents, what type of UV protectant, because BT only lasts for about three or four days in the environment when it's exposed to the sun. So sometimes they add a, sunscreen to it. So just check the other compounds. But in general, no, BT, BT is not harmful to humans. And, and I'll uh, add to that too, that um, the Pest, Ma uh, Pest Management Regulatory Agency regulates BTK and it's responsible um, for ensuring the human health and environmental safety of products um, along with Health Canada. So um, it would have gone through uh, vigorous testing before um, those products were available for use. Um, and as Paul said, BTK naturally degrades in ecosystems, so it's usually um, up to four days after it um, degrades from microorganisms or uh, UV light, and it typically doesn't uh, percolate through the soil beyond 25 centimeters. And, and that's BTK itself, not talking about some of those other formulants that may be added to um, the actual insecticide products. Great, thank you. Um... Tamara, this next question, uh, we kind of covered it, but maybe just um, we can talk about it one more time. How long uh, should people be monitoring the egg masses? Um, so you can really monitor those uh, throughout the winter. So um, they're not going to be hatching until uh, probably the next month or so. So you can monitor them if you want um, all the way up until then, until they hatch as caterpillars. And then if you did want to go ahead and use um, the management technique of egg scraping, you can do that in the meantime. I was out on my property a couple days ago scraping eggs, so all the way until they hatch and even through the winter. Great, and as a follow-up, uh, are there native moths that have, that lay similar egg masses that people should maybe watch out for? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Paul might be able to answer that question better than myself. Not, not directly like that, but the Eastern tent caterpillar, the one that makes tents in roadside cherry trees and hawthorns, 
they have a glycinique type of egg mass that is somewhat similar, but really there's nothing quite like the gypsy moth egg, egg mass. There's nothing you're gonna confuse it with. Maybe a spider's nest, that would be the closest thing. But if, if you saw the very good pictures that Tamara uh, brought today, you'll recognize them anywhere now. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul, does NPV affect other species? Uh, yes, there's specific types of NPV. It's like coronavirus affecting us, while there's other types of coronaviruses for insects. And NPV is just a general category called nuclear polyhedrosis virus. It's just a, a category. So there's specific ones for sawflies, for instance. Those are wasp-like insects that defoliate a lot of conifers, and they've been designed just specifically for those by the environment as a way of crashing the populations when they get too huge. A lot of the viruses, oddly enough, are spread in forest fires. Um, they fire very, very hot temperatures, but the viral particles can withstand that, and they're spread through the forest so that in subsequent years, when those sawfly populations rise again, the virus will kill them. Good, thank you. Uh, all right, Tamara, how do we, um, okay, sorry, some people are wondering, uh, we talk about putting egg masses into soapy water. Um, some people are wondering if they can uh, dispose of them in a bonfire. Yeah, as, as long as uh, your municipality permits, uh, you could dispose of them from uh, with, like by a bonfire. I wouldn't recommend burning actual trees though because you're really gonna be doing more damage to the tree than you are the gypsy moth. So if people are wanting to uh, scrape those egg masses off and then um, throw them in a bonfire, um, then you know that's one way of disposing of them. I've also heard anecdotally, not <laughs> I, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that they make a popping noise when you burn them. So <laughs> kind of interesting. Thank you. Um, Paul, I'll send this next one to you, but uh, you, you might, you, uh, Tamara, you might want to jump in on it too. Um, will climate change have an impact on the expected collapse of the species? So for example, warmer winters. Absolutely. Uh, when I first started teaching forest entomology um, about a million years ago, gypsy moth was barely on the radar. And the reason was we had such cold winters back in the early eighties and consequently, usually they'd get killed off. So you get this odd little small outbreak because the winters were so long and cold. But since, since the last few years, the winters are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And absolutely, we will get more gypsy moth, we'll get murder hornets, we'll get all sorts of things coming into Canada as the weather warms. Right, thank you. Sorry, I brought up murder hornets. <laughs> Um, this next question, uh, maybe Tamara, I'll send it to you. Um, this uh, participant has tried uh, Vaseline um, and, and the sticky material from the garden center. Um, they're, they're wondering, is that an, appro an approved method that they can use? Um, I mean, there's, there's really like, by approved typically like those products that are approved are specifically pesticides um it's not a matter of whether it's approved because um like the pest management regulatory agency wouldn't regulate a product like that um and you know as we kind of briefly touched on uh sticky traps may have an effect on non-target non species so um those like non-target beneficial insects can get stuck on them sometimes wildlife can get stuck on them um, so it's just not something that we would recommend per se, um, but no, there's, there's uh, no body that regulates a product like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question, uh, someone's asking if there are regulations in tiny regarding pesticides. Um, I guess I'll maybe speak to that one. Uh, we do have an overspray policy on our website on um, Tiny uh, www.tiny.ca slash environment. And I believe it, um, it, it speaks to questions like that. Um, if, if your question's not answered um, through that policy, definitely email environment at, at tiny.ca 
and um, I can forward those uh, inquiries onto our public works department and they're always happy to uh, respond to any inquiries of that nature. Um, Paul, what is the ratio of so soap to water if you're um, in, in your jar when you're scraping egg masses? Uh, glug, glug. I just put in uh, like a teaspoon and a half roughly into a typical spray bottle. So you don't need a lot of soap. Right. My general rule is if you can see suds, you probably have enough soap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, uh, another question, uh, Tamara, when should people start considering putting burlap around their trees? And uh, do you have any recommended places where people can purchase burlap? I think you can purchase burlap at like any local hardware store. It doesn't necessarily have to be burlap either. Like if you have an old sheet that you want to use instead, um, you can you can use that. Really, any material that you have lying around that you'll be able to wrap around a tree. Um, I prefer using white sheets and I know um, some other people that I've talked to have like that too just because you can actually see the caterpillars and the egg masses clearer on that um, and sorry what was the second part of the question is it when to um, when to put, put burlap yeah so you can you can really start putting that up um, when the caterpillars hatch um, and typically uh, when the weather gets a bit hotter is when they'll come down the trees and look for shade. Um, so that's the ideal time to put them down. And as I said before, the moths will get stuck in there as well. So you can have that pretty much all the way June to September. Great. Thank you. And I'm just looking at the time. So we're, uh, we've just reached the hour mark. So, um, and there's so many incredible questions. I'm really sorry we haven't had a chance to get to them all, but um, like I mentioned earlier, please, uh, if, if uh, we have it, if we did not get to your question, please email it to environment at tiny.ca or, um, or invasive species at severnsound.ca. Um, yep. <laughs> please forward those questions on and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, we really want everyone to get as much information as they can about gypsy moths. Again, thank you to our speakers and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's, uh, we really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, everyone.